The Feet by Mark Channing Read by Hugh Carr Directed by Brendan James Am I, Richard Haldane Bullen, King's Counsel and an Officer of the Crown, a murderer? Hear the facts and judge for yourself. I liked my Uncle Harvey very much. People who didn't know him well thought him queer. Many collectors of Oriental curios are queer sort of people. Haven't you found that? It is as if something crept out of their curios to inhabit their minds and made them harmless jekylls and hides. They cease to be normal whenever the materialism of the West is overcome by that mysterious something which seems to exude from almost all Eastern things. My Uncle Harvey, however, was queer in a strange way. He was afraid of his curios. They dominated his existence. The fact that most of them were gruesome relics makes this fairly reasonable. I have studied enough psychology to know that. Anyway, I was down from Oxford for the Christmas vacation and Uncle Harvey asked me to dine with him. Now, I have always disliked Bloomsbury. I still do. It depresses me. But because I was fond of the old man, and he had promised to show me his curios, which up to then I had not seen, I accepted the invitation. It was the 22nd of December, I remember, and a damp, foggy night. After dinner, we adjourned to his study, his Chamber of Horrors, as he laughingly called it. As he opened the door of that room, I sensed this queerness to the point of feeling goose flesh all over. It may, of course, have been because he told me that the somber Indian hangings had come from the Nana Sahib's palace at Cawnpore. General Havelock's Highlanders, he said, had torn them down when they wrecked the palace after discovering that awful well, filled to the brim with the bodies of women and children. Mind you, my uncle's study was a cosy room, but its intimacy was, well, stealthy. It was thug-like. That is, it crept upon you as the Indian thugs used to creep upon their victims, strangling all sense of happiness with a quick overcoming and an instantaneous, merciless domination. As I have said, I was fond of my Uncle Harvey. I want you to remember that. Well, as we entered the room, he switched on the lights inside a large cabinet near the fireplace. It was a Victorian bit of furniture, and its glass doors had tightly pleated green silk curtains behind them. To me, lighted up and closed as it was, it seemed rather like a house that held some grim secret, which it wished to conceal. That queerness reached out and literally grabbed me as I opened its doors. My uncle, who was preparing coffee, he always made his own, looked up as he heard the click of the small key. See that big knife with the deep channel running down to its point, Dick? That came from the temple of Kali in southern India. It was used in the sacrificing of babies to the goddess. That tress of hair caked with blood was taken out of the well at Korpor after the massacre of 1857. The dingy-looking bit of rope by the side of it. And these, Uncle Harvey, I asked, interrupting him and 
taking up one or two circlets of silver ankle bells. What are these? I shook it lightly. I wanted to change the subject, you see. The bells had a curiously shrill, sweet sound, I remember. For God's sake, put them down, exclaimed Uncle Harvey. I glanced at him in astonishment. Banging down the methylated spirit lamp of the coffee machine onto the hammered brass deli work tray over which he was bending, he strode over to me. You didn't touch those by any chance, did you? He asked harshly, pointing to two tiny wax models of a woman's feet. They were about an inch long. As I looked at them, I saw that the artist had evidently made them to resemble feet which had recently severed from the leg a few inches above the ankle bones. The shiny redness of the flesh and the whiteness of the splintered bone were horribly realistic. The minute toenails were colored red with henna. Good Lord, no, I hadn't even noticed them, I replied. What's wrong? I asked the question because he looked pale and distraught. Come and have your coffee, Dick, he said gravely, taking me by the arm. This is their story. Somewhere in the 60s, a certain Indian Nawab, who had been forced to leave India on account of his savage cruelty to his people, came to live in England. Being as wealthy as Croesus, he brought over with him his harem and a big staff of servants. He wanted to be received in society, but his reputation for cruelty caused society to boycott him. He lived absolutely isolated from the civilization in which he had taken refuge. Sinister rumors soon got about. Screams of women were heard at night, and it was said that he murdered several of his women servants. Remember in the days of which I am speaking, an English home was far more a castle than it is today. And as the house was always closely shuttered, nobody knew anything for certain. At all events, no less than seven skeletons were dug up in the garden some years later. That's his picture hanging over the cabinet you are looking at. Nasty looking fellow, don't you think? I turned to look at the oil painting. My poor uncle was right. A picture of a tall, bejeweled Indian with the lean, cruel face of a murderous sadist wasn't the sort of thing I'd care to have in any room of mine. When the Nawab died, or was murdered in his turn, resumed my uncle, what was left of his household returned to India, and the house was put up for sale. The first people to buy it had not been there a week before their butler was murdered. All the other servants refused to stay in the house. Its next occupants lost their two children inside a week. The poor mites were found lying in the hall with their necks broken. Neither the parents nor the doctors thought it was an accident. How could it have been? Both these tragedies happened within three months. After that, the house remained empty. The Nawab's agents, under the orders from his successor, had it cleaned every twelve months. But although the rent was nominal, no one could be found to take it. Doubtless because the workmen and charwomen who cleaned the place swore that each time they came, they found the prints of a woman's small feet in the dust on the carpetless stairs 
and also on the marble floor of what used to be the women's apartments. They also maintained that they heard sleigh bells jingling down the passages. None of them ever saw anything, though. Now, as my uncle spoke, I distinctly heard the circlet of bells I had been looking at jingle. I think he did, too. I suppose I had laid it down on the edge of its sister anklet, and it had slipped. Well, he went on, pretending, I think, not to have heard it. Then I took the house, Dick. This house. I took it on certain conditions, though. I said I wanted to live in it a week before I would sign the lease. The agents agreed, and as temporary caretakers put in an Indian who had married a white woman. They couldn't get a white man to take on the job, they said. Now, as you know, I took over your grandfather's curio business. Then, as now, I believe that strange powers are hidden in certain things. That certain things can be either lucky or unlucky. Well, on the day I was to go into this house, a Lascar Indian sailor came to my shop and asked me to buy from him a wax image of a dancing girl. It was a beautiful piece of work. They don't make them anymore. It's a lost art. Sahib, said the Lascar, buy it. It is from the temple of Kali. Whoever has it, or even a part of it in his possession, is under the protection of the goddess. Evil spirits cannot harm him. I bought the thing, and I remember thinking that it would be a good idea to take it with me when I went to try out this house. On the 22nd of December, a year ago today, I arrived with my suitcase. The Indian opened the door. I didn't like the look of him directly I saw him. His eyes had a glassy look which I put down to opium and dismissed him from my mind. I found prepared for me the late Nawab's bedroom, a smallish room with carved sandalwood paneling and doors. Beautiful work. I'll show it to you before you go if you'd like to see it. It all looked snug and inviting. There was a bright fire burning, and it had been thoroughly cleaned. Though, like all other servants of his kind, I found later that of the three carved sandalwood shelves above the mantelpiece, he had only dusted the two bottom ones. But I'm tall, and perhaps he couldn't reach the top one. Well, one of the first things I did was to stand the image of the dancing girl on the table under the lamp while I had supper. I wanted to have a good look at her. I'd been too busy to do so before. I had brought a bottle of port and some cold chicken and a couple of books on Eastern mysticism, and to tell the truth, I was rather looking forward to the night. That little statue was almost lifelike, Dick. The enthusiasm of a true collector rang in my uncle's tones. Even to the cast mark on her little forehead, every detail was exact, and the colors were so bright she might have been made that very day. Now, you may take it from me that I was wide awake, as wide awake as I am now. You may laugh at me if you will, but while I was looking at her, I saw a man's thin brown hand, its fingers covered with gorgeous rings, reach over the table as if to take away the little figure. 
Whether I was imagining it or not, I snatched up the statue and thrust it hastily into my breast pocket. As I did so, the hand melted into thin air. That's what comes of reading books on oriental mysticism, I muttered. And getting up from the table, I settled myself in an inviting-looking easy chair at one side of the fire. For an hour or more, nothing happened. Only rats squeaking and scuttering in the wainscoting, and all that. Then I heard, or thought I heard, a faint moaning. But I decided that it might quite well be a loose shutter swinging in the wind somewhere. I must have dozed, for I was suddenly wakened by a hand feeling in my breast pocket. Although the lamp was burning brightly, I could see nothing. But I instinctively grabbed at whatever it was, and my fingers closed round a slim, cold wrist. My uncle frowned. And for the first time in my life, I saw fear in his eyes, and believe me, to see fear in the eyes of a hard rider to hounds is not a pleasant sight. Port and mysticism aren't good for the imagination, uncle, I said as cheerily as I could, and gulped down my coffee. The room was getting on my nerves, as strong as they are. No, Dick, reported my uncle gravely. It wasn't imagination. It was something my fingers could hold. A damp, soggy, cold wrist, like the wrist of a corpse. But it seemed to slip from my fingers. Then I heard the chinking of a nonch girl's ankle bells, faintly on the other side of the door leading into what was the Navab's harem. Jumping to my feet, I flung open the door and I found myself looking into the glassy eyes of the Indian caretaker. Did you call Sahib? He asked, looking at me with those dead fish-like eyes of his. I did some rapid thinking I've already told you, Dick, that I had taken a dislike to the man. I disliked still more finding him where he was at the moment. So I decided to keep him under observation. I bade him come in and sit with me. And he came in. They say this house is haunted, I said. By way of starting a conversation, he was evidently loath to begin. It is true, Sahib, he said, and I have never heard anything colder than his voice. The boot spirit of a young dancing girl is in the house. She was the Nav's favorite, but she fell in love with a young Sahib saw her at the window one day. They were about to elope when the Navab caught her. And then, I questioned. Then he cut off her feet himself and sent them to the young Englishman. My uncle paused for a moment and looked towards the cabinet. And then, Dick, I swear, he said to me earnestly, that the chinking of those ankle bells began again in the other room, but much louder. They were coming towards me. Whether it was the fog, or whether it was that the caretaker hadn't put enough oil in the lamp, I don't know, but at that moment, the room grew darker. Slowly, the door swung open, and the sound of the ankle bells became shrill and loud. My Uncle Harvey paused and mopped his forehead. 
Then, Dick, he said tensely, then I saw the feet. As he spoke, it seemed to me that the room became darker. I saw the feet, I say, eviscerated my uncle. They seemed to have been severed from the leg just above the ankle only a few minutes before. You saw the wax ones. Well, they were like that. My uncle shuddered. I wish to God I could forget them. I'd be so much happier. Then he pulled himself together. They passed me and mounted onto the lid of a carved sandalwood chest inlaid with mother of pearl that stood on the opposite side of the fireplace. It's still there. I distinctly saw the fresh blood glisten in the indented hollows behind the ankle bones, Dick. They, she seemed to be trying to reach something on the topmost of the three shelves. I couldn't speak or move. Then that moaning began again on the corner where the chest was. By a tremendous effort, I forced myself to look at my companion. He had risen from his chair. No devil in hell could have looked more evil than he did. I sprang up, oversetting the lamp. Siva! Siva! I heard myself screaming in tones as crackling as those of a man of ninety. Siva, the destroyer, is protecting me. You cannot harm me. As I screamed, he sprang at me, and I leapt from him. I felt his right hand dart into my breast pocket, seize the statue, and drag it out. I only just managed to clutch it at its feet, which broke off in my hand. Then I fell and must have stunned myself. When I came to, the caretaker, a stout madrasi, was standing at the table with my morning tea. He seemed to think I had laid down on the floor to rest. Master will please excuse he said, that I did not let him in yesterday, but they told me that you are the key sahib. Therefore, having put everything ready, I spent the night at the hospital with my wife. She died this morning, sahib. My uncle looked at me, as if he suspected I might be amused at his story. But I wasn't. The misery in his face fairly frightened me. The feet of the statue I found clasped in my hand, he said, slowly. There was no trace of the rest of it. As I sit here, Dick, I swear before heaven that I believe those bits of wax are all that stand between me and the evil thing that is still in this house. It may be stupid and all that, but I'm convinced that only so long as they are in my possession, I am safe. He rose and crossed to the sideboard to mix a dock and Doris. I made up my mind, then and there, this fear complex must be smashed once and forever. If it weren't smashed, I was convinced he would go mad. I decided to take away those wax feet tomorrow. I would tell him I had done so and that they had unfortunately been lost. His obsession would vanish then, I was sure. Going over to the cabinet, I slipped them into my waistcoat pocket and closed the doors. What happened to the man whom you thought was the caretaker? I asked, casually as I stood to go. It was ten to twelve. My uncle glanced up at the Novob's picture. I suppose he went back to hell, he said, and opened the door to go into the hall. Coming down the stairs, as though their wearer was running, 
we both heard the sound of the ankle bells. Instinctively, my hand shot to my waistcoat pocket. It was empty. The feet! gasped my Uncle Harvey and fell dead. Production, sound design, and editing by Brendan James. Please support the Black Dog Chronicles by liking this video, sharing on your favorite social media, and subscribing. As always, we thank you for listening. This is Hugh Carr. Is it possible that you are missing out on new editions of the Black Dog Chronicles? <gasps> oh no! Don't despair. Simply remember to click the notification bell next to the subscribe button on our channel. Never miss another edition of the Black Dog Chronicles again.